Greetings everyone! Welcome back to the bench, the uh, really messy bench. Getting to the point I need to clean it up. Well, if you remember, the last amplifier video I made a week or so ago, it was the MOSFET Class A amplifier. It was a really simple design. It did its business. But one thing I noticed, relative to its supply voltage, I used 9 volts, I didn't get a lot of output. I used an 8 ohm speaker, got about 360 milliwatts. Should be able to do a little better than that. Also, it consumes an enormous amount of power to get that 360 milliwatts. It draws just shy of 6 watts from the power supply. So, you know, these parts get pretty hot, the transistor and resistor here. So what I want to do is see if I can improve this a little bit. I mean, it's still Class A. It still dissipates quite a bit of heat, but I'm hoping for the uh, supply voltage of 9 volts, seeing if I can get a little bit more output and improve the efficiency a little bit. Well, here's the schematic of the circuit. You might want to watch that last video where I uh, went into detail what's going on and uh, you know how the circuit works. Again, I'm not using some fancy lateral audio MOSFET. I just had this in the drawer and I, that's what I grabbed and used. The one problem with the circuit is that it uses a resistor as a current source and be much better to have a constant current source here. And as I always say, resistors make lousy constant current sources because we're putting a signal in here and the voltage at this point is going to go up and down with that signal. And as you change the voltage drop across a resistor, the current changes. So you can see it's not a very good constant current source. So what I'm going to do is take this resistor out and replace it with a constant current source and we'll take new measurements and see how the amplifier performs. Okay, I want to go over how a constant current source works. I did make a video a while back on how it works, but I'll just kind of briefly go over it again. And before I forget, I want to say that I just want to replace the resistor with that. I don't want to change the other circuit, you know, integrate this in with the circuit any more than just replacing that resistor. Because if I do that, then it's not really the same circuit anymore and, you know, we might get different results. So how does a constant current source work? Well, if you saw the other video, I think I was working with what's actually known as a current sink. That works from the negative supply rail. And because this is positive, everything will seem to be flipped and reversed because I'm using a PNP transistor instead of an NPN. So you're dealing with negative voltages. Keep that in mind though, but when I actually do calculations, I'm not going to put the negative in front. Just keep in mind that that's the way it's done. So what we have here is, like I said, a PNP transistor, and we have an emitter resistor, and this is an important part because it helps us set the current. We also have some sort of voltage reference. In other words, we put current through this and it produces a fixed voltage drop. And in a moment you'll see how that works with the transistor to generate a constant current. This is the load. That's actually the rest of the circuit. Okay, so what I'm going to do is design this thing out here, run through the design and uh, kind of cover how it works as I go. Most importantly, we need to know the current we're going to run at. And I'm going to keep it about the same that I used in the amplifier in the previous video. That was around 600, 700 milliamps or so. So we'll just say 600 milliamps. Where do I get that from? Well, with a 9 volt supply, I know the peak current of the speaker would be somewhere around half a milliamp. And speakers are reactive loads, so it's nice to have a uh, pad it with a little bit of headroom. So the next thing we need to look at is the value of this resistor. You know, this is important. It's a biasing resistor that connects from the base to the ground. 
And as you know, you have to pull some current through the base emitter junction for the transistor to even turn on. And we need to pull some current through the, the reference here for it to operate. So what would this value be? Well, I need to know the gain of this transistor. So if we're going to run this circuit at 600 milliamps, I went to the gain chart, the uh, curves on the data sheet, and found out it's somewhere around 80 or 90. So to achieve that, I need to pull a certain amount of current through the base. And I'll give it some headroom, we'll say 0.7 amps, 700 milliamps, divided by 70. We'll say the gain 70. We'll also give it a little bit of padding as well. It's always good to do that. Plus, it's easy to calculate. It's only 10 milliamps. So we need uh, 10 milliamps flowing in this part of the circuit. Although we did pad that number a bit, it's better to double this. You know, say about 20 milliamps. Okay, so 20 milliamps then. Well, that's one part of the calculation. What about the voltage drop? Well, if we're using 9 volts, and we're going to have... The voltage drop from a reference here and I'm going to use two diodes in series and I'll talk about that later why I'm doing that and you know the voltage drop of a silicon diode 0.7 volts or so we'll just say 1.4 volts for the two diodes so it's 9 minus 1.4 that gives us 7.6 volts 7.6 divided by 2 milliamps Resistor value would be 380 ohms. Well, that's not a common value, so I'll just grab a 330 ohm resistor. Okay, I wrote some of the figures down. That leaves us with one resistor value to figure out. And this is where it gets interesting, because I have to explain how the circuit works in order to calculate the value of this resistor. As I said before, when we power this up, some current goes through the reference here. And some goes through the base junction, the emitter base junction of the transistor. If you recall, the, uh, the base to emitter junction voltage of a PNP transistor is about 0.7 volts. Actually, it's negative 0.7, but again, I'm going to ignore the negative values for this. And I selected the voltage reference to be larger than that. The voltage reference has to be higher than that for the circuit to work properly. So I'm using two diodes in series, as I mentioned before, for 1.4 volts. So what's going to happen here? There's going to be some equilibrium reached. The voltage drop, of course, has to be the same at these two points. So the voltage drop across this resistor is going to equal this minus the junction voltage drop. So if we take 1.4 minus 0.7, we end up with 0.7 volts across this resistor. So our, our collector current is going to be the current through our load here minus current going through the base. And because the base current is so small, we can just ignore that for designing this current source. It's not a critical thing. So you can use 600 milliamps to calculate the current through this resistor. So there you go, you have the two values you need. 0.7 volts divided by 600 milliamps. So the calculometer here is saying one point, or about 1 1.2 ohms. Okay, so how does the circuit actually regulate current? Okay, so let's say that the load resistance increases. That means it wants to draw less current. Less current's gonna flow through a resistor. That means that the voltage drop across the resistor wants to drop. And remember that the voltage at these two points, the voltage drop at these two points, has to be the same. So if this voltage drop is decreasing here, it's going to shunt current away from our reference through the transistor. And it's going to turn the transistor on more. And that's going to increase the current in the collector trying to bring that that current back up and the converse is true as well let's say this resistance decreased in value that means it wants to try to draw more current 
Well, more current through this means a higher voltage drop. Well, again, since the voltage drop at these two points has to be the same, more current is going to shunt through the reference. And since less current is going through the base emitter junction, if it's going to lower that current, bring it back into spec. Let's build it out and see how it works. Okay, here's the circuit. We have the transistor on the heat sink because it's going to dissipate some power. This is that biasing resistor I talked about right here. I have the two diodes as the reference. Because the voltage drop stays relatively the same. It does change a bit with current. But the forward voltage drop is around 0.7 volts. And I use two power resistors here for the emitter resistor. And I just grab these two values and to calculate them. It was a 2 ohm and a uh, 3.9 ohm. And to calculate the parallel resistance, and that's what it is, 1.32 ohms. So let's see how our little circuit works. Okay, put a 10 ohm load resistor there. Let's see how this thing works. And it's uh, it's pretty close. It's uh, 610 milliamps, running at 9 volts. Okay, let's check its regulation here. So I have this 10 ohm resistor, which is close to its maximum operating voltage. You see, if this resistance is too high, the voltage drop across this becomes too high for it to operate. And that's due to the maximum supply voltage. You can only put so much voltage across this resistor. Plus, this needs a little bit of headroom to operate as well. So when the voltage approaches the supply voltage, this can no longer regulate. And that would be the clipping near the positive part of the output signal. So let's see what happens when I short the load that's on the output of the current source here. See, now we're running at 600 milliamps. If I short that out, it goes up a little bit to 630. Take it off, it drops, put it on. So yeah, that's pretty much across the whole current spectrum of this, you know, pulling it down to ground, pretty much shorting this, you know, where is it, this resistor out here, it still keeps the current about the same. There'll be a little bit of change. It's not precision or anything, but you can see how well it does. Okay, so we got the constant current source designed for our amplifier and delve a little deep into how it works but you know me i can't make a short video so it's time to transfer this circuit over to the amplifier board right here replacing this resistor and uh, hopefully it works all right so i removed this resistor and replaced it with this current source ignore this stuff here this is not part of the circuit from some other little project. But there it is. Let's fire it up. Uh, only drawing 300 milliamps, probably the uh, that biasing resistor on the current source. Let's see if I can adjust this. Probably out of whack. Oh, there's waking up there. Oh, that's a touchy control. Well, let's get it on the oscilloscope here and see what it looks like. Okay, let's uh, see if we can get this going again. Yeah, that control is touchy. Touchy, touchy. Let's crank this up. Okay, there's our clipping points. You can still see the uh, second order harmonic distortion. 
because it's pointy on the top and more rounded on the bottom. That's pretty typical of that. But one thing you should recognize right away is uh, 2.21 volts. With the uh, other circuit, just using the resistor, it was 1.71. Just have to dial out the clipping point as good as you can. It's hard to discern that. Well, if I use that, what is that? 2.29, 8 or 9 square divided by 8 ohms. Now we're getting 650 milliwatts, so we have definitely increased the output power a lot more. So you can see that's one big improvement. Distortion is going to be about the same. There's no point in checking that. This video is getting long anyway. But I'm going to make a few more adjustments to the circuit to see if I can improve the touchiness of the bias control. Okay, made changes to the circuit. Actually simplified it a bit by one part. Now I'm adjusting that control as much as I did before. Now you don't see any movement. I have to really turn that control to make any difference. So you can see it makes quite a bit of difference for what I did. It's not touchy at all anymore. So you want to set the bias so there's about half the supply voltage on the drain of the MOSFET. As far as output, not the same as it was before. Okay, give you a little music sample here and then the final schematic and we'll wrap this one up. This video is getting pretty long. <laughs> Yep, sounds fine. Definitely cranks louder than the previous design with the resistor. You lose a lot of power having that resistor. Okay, so here's the schematic of the original circuit and the schematic of the new circuit. Of course, this is the current source circuit up here and the revised amplifier circuit down here. Actually simplified this resistor, which was 22K and connected up to the supply before, is now connected to the drain. What it does is give some feedback. And we used to have a resistor here, a source resistor. That also gave feedback, but it's not really needed now with this. This does a better job. It removes the touchiness of this control and it might improve thermal stability and maybe lower distortion a bit. So it's just, you know, it simplifies it. It's just a better way to go. Now I can tweak and, you know, mess around with the circuit, these values, and make the amplifier maybe a little better. But, yeah, it's working good enough right now, so I'm not going to monkey with it. It's actually giving us power similar to what, like, a chip amp would do. And, you know, if you adjusted this thing for 12 volt use you probably get around a watt of output power and that's you know pretty much the same you'd expect from a chip amp or you know a discrete amplifier with a 12 volt supply running an 8 ohm load the efficiency is improved it's now 11.6 percent where the old circuit was only 6.15 percent well that's not going to keep greenpeace from kicking down your door but it is much better than the previous circuit. And that's mainly because you're getting almost double the output power, not quite, but you're really drawing the same current. Well, that'll do it for this one. Thanks for watching.